Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to tell you about the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. Now, I'm unlikely to have a lot of time this week, what with my wife finally coming to live with me on the 2nd of March. So this episode needs to be short, snappy and ideally interesting. Minions get a lot of love in this series, too much considering how bad some of them are looking at you Magma Rager. So today we're going to look at each of the classic and basic weapons and the lore behind them, if any. Now I've proved you can do a whole episode about a weapon with the Doomhammer episode and while I'll also be covering the obvious weapons here I'll be doing so in a summarised fashion. If you're hungry to learn more about a specific weapon feel free to let me know in the comments. Firstly I'll cover all the priest, mage, druid and warlock weapons. Now that that's out the way, on to the Paladin. We've already briefly touched on Light's Justice in our Prince Malchazar video, as it was a weapon dropped by the Eridar in the World of Warcraft raid, Karazhan. One of the things we learnt about Malchazar is that he's a fan of all things legendary, be they cards in Hearthstone or hoarder of rare weapons in WoW. Light's Justice is one such weapon, though its stats in Hearthstone aren't really all that impressive. This can be explained by comparing it to the weapon's properties in World of Warcraft. Light's Justice would have rarely connected with the body of a foe in combat. It was a weapon used to boost the healing abilities of paladins that specialised in using the curative powers of the Holy Light. As well as increasing the caster's spirit, the stat that governs mana regeneration, the hammer also gave a substantial boost to the paladin's spell power, allowing them to heal for more each cast. It's not offensively powerful in Hearthstone, as aggression was never its primary purpose. The true silver champion was not a paladin only weapon, it was a rare weapon that could be crafted by blacksmiths in World of Warcraft. Though if you're thinking of starting up a character to learn this weapon, you're out of luck. The recipe has since been removed from the game. This two-handed blade can be wielded from level 47, and when it was relevant within WoW, would have taken a fair amount of time to collect the resources, or cost a fair amount of gold. The 30 mithril bars were the easy part. Mithril was the second highest level common metal at the time, after thorium. The 16 true silver bars from which the weapon gets its namesake would have been more of a challenge. It was a rare mineral found in the higher level questing areas of vanilla World of Warcraft. The six star rubies would have been even rarer, with a chance to be found only occasionally in mineral veins. Eight solid grinding stones would have been easy, created from the rock splinters of mithril veins. To get the six thick leather, you needed a skinning pal, and finally, to collect the four breath of winds, the blacksmith would need to journey either to Tanaris or Silithus and slay air elementals. So, what did you get for all this effort? No stats but an interesting chance on hit effect. Described in the old Warcraft trading card game as a bright blade that sings a chorus of honour and triumph. With each hit, the true silver champion had a small chance of casting a protective barrier upon its wielder, like that of the priest's power word shield ability. Hearthstone depicts this effect by having the paladin hero heal up a little before swinging the weapon. Sword of Justice was a rare weapon that could drop after the Tribunal of Ages encounter in the Halls of Stone. The Tribunal was essentially a large titan database storing information of events that happened thousands and thousands of years ago. Bram Bronzebeard looked to access the Tribunal to find out the origins of the Dwarven race. After fighting off waves of iron dwarves, Bran discovered dwarves were descendants of the Earthen, infected with a malady called the Curse of Flesh, a creation of the Old Gods to weaken the forces of the Titanforge after their imprisonment. Well, even when talking about weapons, I can't escape Titan and Old God lore. There's no real lore behind the sword itself, but since it's stored in a Titanforge facility, it likely has connections to them. It was a decent drop for Retribution Paladins or either of the DPS Warrior specialisations. There's no real connection between the sword's Hearthstone effect and its WoW version either. I guess you could say the sword buffed the strength and stamina stats of its wielder, and kind of does the same for minions in Hearthstone. I suppose we can count the Ashbringer in this list too. 
The sword was crafted by Magni Bronzebeard, king of the dwarves, for the paladin Alexandrus Mograine. Magni's emotions ran high at the time, having just heard of the supposed death of his brother Muradin. The rage and grief Magni felt while forging the Ashbringer made for a better weapon. The golden disc of the Ashbringer was originally an orb of great evil used by an orcish warlock during the Second War, causing Alexandrus' hand to rot upon touch. His hand was restored when he and his allies reversed the orb's properties, making it a powerful tool of the light. With Ashbringer in hand, Alexandrus could put up a staunch resistance to the undead scourge that swept through the Eastern Kingdoms now until betrayed by his son, Renault. He and the Ashbringer became corrupted pawns of Kel'Thuzad, the Lich King's right hand. Alexandrus would be redeemed by his son, Darian, but in return, he became one of the Lich King's death knights. He would wield the corrupted Ashbringer until he could break from the Lich King's control with help from Tyrion Fordring. Confronted by the Lich King, Darian threw the Ashbringer to Tyrion. The sword instantly became cleansed and Tyrion chased the Lich King away from an assault on Light's Hope Chapel, where many of the most powerful heroes of the Alliance were buried. Tyrion would wield the sword for some time, even managing to slay the current Lich King, Arthas Menethil, and replace him with Bolvar Fordragon, who sought to suppress the Scourge. Recently, Tyrion passed the Ashbringer on after forces of Azeroth suffered a defeat against the Burning Legion upon the Broken Shore. Tyrion would be unable to recover from his wounds and died. On that happy note, let's move on to another class, the Hunter. Though, since this would just be me rehashing stuff I've already mentioned in my Hunter cards in other Blizzard games video, I'll be brief. The Eaglehorn bow was a drop from Rage during the vanilla days, and the Gladiator's longbow is likely a reference to the plethora of Gladiator's longbow player versus player weapons in Warcraft. There's no connection between the Eaglehorn longbow and its Hearthstone ability. Though, the Gladiator's longbow makes the Hunter immune while attacking. Like a PvP Hunter, it helps the hero specialise in minions combat. The card text for the rogue's Perdition's Blade reads, Perdition's Blade is Ragnaros's backup weapon while Sulfurus is in the shop, likely a reference to the fact that the blade was an epic drop from Ragnaros in the 40-man Molten Core raid. Its ability in Hearthstone is a strong representation of its effect in WoW. It had a chance on hit to blast enemies with additional fire damage, and in Hearthstone this fiery blast is let out upon equipping as part of a combo. The Assassin's Blade is just a random drop in the Shadowfang Keep dungeon, and the Emerald Ripper depicted in the art is dropped by Morose in the Karazhan raid. I get the feeling the Hearthstone team may have added this blade to Valera's arsenal as it resembles the two green daggers she wields. These blades were given to Valera by Regar Earth Fury before competing in the Diamond Gladiator tournament. I suppose it was the least the Orc could do since she was his slave that fought battles to the death to fill his pockets. Regar took his Gladiator team to the Hall of Legends in Orgrimmar and allowed them to choose their weapons. The daggers Valera chose were initially made for an Orc, hence their size, but while being as long as swords, these blades were perfectly balanced perfect tools of assassination for a rogue like Valera. The Shaman's Stormforged Axe is our second weapon crafted by blacksmiths that first appeared in the Burning Crusade expansion. Its agility stat made it a good choice for Enhancement Shaman. The axe portrayed in the card's art is in fact the Lightning Welk Axe, which did not come to the game until the Cataclysm expansion, dropping in the Throne of Tides heroic dungeon from the Naga Sea Witch Lady Nasjar. Like Ashbringer, the Doomhammer is a weapon of legend. Since our episode on it, there has been additional information brought to light. Once an unknown material, the head of the hammer was forged in a pool of lava upon the planet of Draenor by the orc Gelnar. The hammer in its namesake was passed down through generations, which ended with Orgrim Doomhammer. Orgrim rose to lead the Orcish Horde upon Azeroth, but was ultimately defeated. The hammer, but not its namesake, would be passed to Thrall, who would rise and free his people both from internment camps and from their blood tie to the Burning Legion. Later in the Legion expansion, Thrall passes on the Doomhammer to another Shaman. On to the warrior! 
The Fiery War Axe is an epic random well drop with a similar property to the Perdition's Blade. The two-handed axe occasionally procs to deliver additional fire damage, with the bonus of doing yet more damage over time. While most weapons need to be enchanted to let off a subdued glow, the Fiery War Axe constantly burns with a dull orange glow. The actual axe depicted is the Axe of Grounded Flame, which was rewarded to heroes after completing the quest The Return of Baron Geddon in the Cataclysm expansion. This one-handed axe's stats were better suited to an Enhancement Shaman than a Warrior. There are actually several Arcanite Reapers in WoW. The first is crafted by blacksmiths, but they needed to communicate with alchemists and enchanters to get the materials for it. Arcanite bars were an alchemical transmutation, made using thorium and an arcane crystal. The leather was a piece of rugged leather enchanted by using a lesser eternal essence. All that was needed after that were a couple of dense grinding stones, and voila! The blacksmith could craft a bone-crunching weapon that provided stamina and attack power buffs. Later incarnations of the Arcanite Reaper would be heirloom weapons that a character can use from level 1 all the way up to the higher levels that scale each time they go up a level. Finally, Gore Howl, another weapon of legend that could have its own episode, and the weapon of Gromash Hellscream, said to be named after the howl the axe emitted as it swung through the air. It went through three generations of the Hellscream line before being inherited by Grom. His grandfather used the axe to kill six gigantic Gron. The hearts of these Gron were then forged into the blade, giving it a peerless, untold strength. In Grom's hand, the Gorhal would slay several legendary foes. Firstly, Cenarius, and later, Manoroth, freeing the orcs from their blood curse that bound them to the Legion. With the death of Manoroth, Grom's time using the Gorhal also came to an end, as he died in the aftermath. The war chief thrall would pass Gorhal onto Grom's son, Garrosh, who later became war chief. But Garrosh's lust for power would see him discard Gorhal in favour of an old god replica. Gorhal's current location is unknown, though Garrosh would come to wield an alternate Gorhal when he travelled to Draenor in an alternate timeline. It's as confusing as it sounds. Malkazar also drops Gorhal for players, whether this is the original or another alternate version is never made clear. The weapon's flavour text reads, The axe of Grom Hellscream has sown terror across hundreds of battlefields. So, there you have it, an overview of the classic and basic weapons. Some here have deeper lore and are definite candidates for later episodes, but it felt odd to leave them out. I really hope you enjoyed. If you did, liking and sharing this video really helps the channel out and I'd be very thankful for it. I mean, you could always dislike too, but it's like a little lawfield dagger to my heart each time you do. If you've enjoyed the art, I've done my best to credit the artist below, and if you want to keep up to date with all things Six Gamers, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Until next time, happy hearthstoning.